Hello everyone and welcome back to our next lab recording. This video will cover the urinary system. In this presentation, we're first going to introduce the functions of the urinary system and then we'll make our way into the components that make this system up. One of the big things that we will discuss with this topic is the blood flow through the kidneys and we're also going to discuss the concepts around urinalysis. You may or may not have started on the urinary system in your lecture class but again, a word of assurance, I will only be testing you on information in the lab class that is covered in the lab presentations. So while the functions of the urinary system seem rather straightforward, their implications in terms of the homeostasis of the entire body are quite vast. The kidneys are one of the components in our bodies that act as a filter to clean out our blood and remove nitrogenous wastes from the cardiovascular system. The kidneys will be one of our body's most important blood volume regulators. The kidneys have a great number of their functional units that will aid in maintaining the concentrations of electrolytes in the blood as well as maintaining the pH of the blood. When we bring too much of a certain substance into the body, the kidneys are going to be one of the major regulators that will help to excrete any excess product that we no longer need. So maintaining the fluid and electrolyte balance, as well as our acid-base balance, are some of the prime functions of the kidneys. As I mentioned, the functions of the kidneys are short and sweet. However, we are going to elaborate quite a bit on what these functions are. And by the time we make it to the end of this presentation and start talking about urinalysis, we will hopefully have learned quite a bit about how the kidneys do their jobs. Now truly, the only component of the urinary system so far that I've mentioned are the kidneys. However, the urinary system has four components that are all seen on this slide. First and foremost, we do have the kidneys. And the kidneys are often looked at as the major players of the urinary system because these are the organs that actually function as the filter and control what substances remain in the blood and also control what substances leave the blood. Another one of the major functions of the kidneys is to produce urine, and the rest of the components of the urinary system have their functions around excreting that urine. The four components of the urinary system are the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. Again, I'll just say once more that the kidneys are going to get most of our attention in this lab presentation, but I do want to give an introduction to the rest of these components as they are truly a part of the urinary system. The ureter is a long tube that leads from the kidneys down to the urinary bladder. And the sole function of the ureters is to transport urine that is produced by the kidneys down into the urinary bladder. Once urine makes its way into the urinary bladder, this structure is primarily going to be used to store excess urine. The urinary bladder does have its own smooth muscle, and it is lined by a mucous membrane as it's connected to the outside environment through the urethra the urethra is going to regulate the release of urine from the urinary bladder. In particular, the urethra will be different lengths in males versus females. But regardless of its length, it is going to serve the same function in both sexes. So this picture shows us the cat as a specimen and all of the components that are included in the urinary system. First and foremost, we'll see the kidneys. We will hopefully recognize this as the kidneys, as the renal artery and the renal vein will be coming to and from the kidneys. I'm well aware that the structures inside of the cat can get a little confusing at times as all of these structures are jumbled together. But using the logic that we've just discussed with the structure of the urinary system, we'll see that this is going to be the ureter. The ureter is this tube that will come from the kidneys and travel all the way down to the urinary bladder. You can see the urinary bladder found here. It is very important for us to note that there are two kidneys and will therefore be two ureters. Both ureters will enter into the urinary bladder, but there's only one urinary bladder and only one urethra. The urinary bladder can specifically be found in the pelvic cavity, and the urethra is going to connect it to the external environment, hence why its lining is a mucous membrane. We can see the four components of the urinary system shown here. Now, as I have mentioned, the structure of the kidneys in particular is what we're primarily going to focus on in terms of the anatomy in this presentation. The kidneys get a very, very specific structure and have many different parts. And we're going to go over the anatomy of the kidneys now. So the first thing about the kidneys that we want to note is that there are different layers that can be found in the kidneys from superficial to deep. The most superficial structure on the kidney is what's known as the renal capsule. That's going to be this connective tissue layer that wraps around the outside. 
the renal capsule will cover up the kidney and lay on the next deepest layer known as the renal cortex. And we can see the renal cortex in this area right here. The renal cortex is the outermost layer of the kidney that's going to contain the functional units of the kidneys. The functional unit of the kidney is known as the nephron. And the nephron is essentially a tube that can be found in the kidney that facilitates the filtration of blood. There can be up to around 2 million nephrons in each kidney. As we continue to travel deep into the kidneys, we'll come to this inner layer known as the renal medulla. And that's going to contain all of these structures that can be found towards the inside of the kidneys. Both the renal cortex and the renal medulla will contain parts of the nephrons. But before we start talking about the nephron, we'll also see that there are some other structures that can be found within the renal medulla. Specifically, one of the structures that we'll see right here are known as renal pyramids. We call these renal pyramids because of their triangular-like shape. In between each of the renal pyramids, we'll find what's known as a renal column. This structure will be noted on the next slide. But you can see that in between the pyramids, there's this lighter area that separates the renal pyramids. Those are going to be the renal columns. Fluids from the renal pyramids are eventually going to dump into the channel system of the kidneys. The channel system is consisting of all of these tube-like structures that can be found here depicted in this yellowish-white color. Essentially, these smaller tubes are eventually going to join to form larger tubes, and then these larger tubes are going to form to form an even larger tube that will eventually become the ureter. We start here with the minor calyx. The minor calyces, in particular, will receive urine from the renal pyramids. Urine is going to be collected in each of these minor calyces, and then the minor calyces will eventually meet to form what's known as the major calyx. There are several major calyces in every kidney. The major calyces will continue to fuse, and that will form this structure, which is known as the renal pelvis. And then the renal pelvis will continue the flow of urine down into the ureter, and from there we know that the ureter will empty into the urinary bladder. It is the ureter in particular that connects the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Now there's two other structures on this slide that are very, very important to the function of the kidneys. And they're actually two structures that we've already learned through the cardiovascular system. They are the renal artery and the renal vein. We must remember that we'll also have another kidney, so this can be depicted as the right renal artery and the right renal vein. We will shortly come to learn the pathway that blood takes as it goes through the kidneys. But what we should already know is that the renal arteries will take blood out to the kidneys and the renal veins will take deoxygenated blood away from the kidneys. It is from the renal artery that the cardiovascular system will continue to branch and eventually form small vessels that course throughout the kidneys. And it is this circulation that can be found in the kidneys that will facilitate the filtration of blood. Any blood that is left over from the filtration that's facilitated by the kidneys will come back to the inferior vena cava through the renal veins. So despite the simplicity of these two structures, they play a major role in the function of the kidney and bringing good blood to the kidneys and bad blood from the kidneys. On this slide in particular, you can just see another view of what the kidney looks like in a frontal section. You can see the renal cortex that can be found out here, but what you can see on this slide that you couldn't see on the last slide is the extreme vascularity of the renal cortex. You can see all of these branches that are coming off of the renal artery and eventually coming out here to the cortex and branching out. It is up here in the cortex that we will start the process of filtration. You can see the renal medulla found just below this containing the renal pyramids as well as the renal columns, which are now labeled here on the slides you can see that it is the renal columns that are the prime locations where the renal arteries and renal veins will travel to and from the renal cortex. The renal pyramids will not have a lot of vascularity in them because they're going to be containing other tubes that are carrying urine out to the minor calyces. But in order for the fluid to pass from the renal pyramids into the minor calyces, they must come out of the renal papilla. I've just come back to this slide just to quickly show you that the renal papillae are referring to these areas at the points of the renal pyramids. So once blood is taken from the renal artery out to the renal cortex, it will eventually be filtered in our functional unit which is known as the nephron. There will be many different nephrons that are filtering our blood, and basically the nephron is a little tube that's going to collect all of the waste products that come from the blood and direct them through the renal papillae into the minor calyces.
As discussed, the minor calyces will eventually flow into the major calyces. The major calyces will flow into the renal pelvis, which is this region over here. And then the renal pelvis will lead into the ureter, which takes urine down to the urinary bladder to be stored until it's ready to be released by the urethra. So as I've mentioned, the nephron can be referred to as the functional unit of the kidney. And it is this blue structure that is indicating the nephron. There are different parts of the nephron, and each region will filter a different substance. And it is this functional unit that is the prime player in the filtration of nitrogenous wastes from the bloodstream. So let's talk about the anatomy of the nephron. The first structure that can be found at the proximal end of the nephron is known as the Bowman's capsule. The Bowman's capsule is this crescent-shaped structure that wraps around this capillary bed known as a glomerulus. I'll discuss this glomerulus very shortly. But it is in the glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule that filtration will be taking place. The Bowman's capsule is going to collect all of the filtrate that comes out from the blood. And that's going to start its flow down to the different parts of the nephron. You can see that the nephron will have this squiggly region right here, and then eventually dip down very, very low, and then come back and have another squiggly region. Each of these regions get their own name and contribute to filtration in their own way. The first region that we find here after the Bowman's capsule is what's known as the proximal convoluted tubule, which can be abbreviated as the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule. We call this the proximal convoluted tubule because it's the convoluted tubule that's more proximally located in the nephron. After the PCT, the nephron is going to drop down very far in a structure known as the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle can be separated into a thin descending portion and a thick ascending portion, but we will not be making that distinction with the loop of Henle in this course. Eventually, the loop of Henle is going to come back up and enter what's known as the distal convoluted tubule. That's going to be this squiggly portion that's found at the distal end of the nephron. And after filtrate makes its way through the distal convoluted tubule, it's going to dump into a structure known as the collecting duct. The collecting ducts will receive filtrate from many different nephrons. And that's what all of these other arrows are indicating. Many other nephrons are also going to be dumping into this structure. And then urine is going to make its way down into the renal papillae. As the renal papillae can be found at the tips of the renal pyramids, that tells us that the collecting ducts are going to be found in the renal pyramids as well. So these are the primary structures that compose what we know as the nephron. However, those are not the only components on this slide that we need to be concerned about. Again, I already mentioned the glomerulus, which is another extremely important component that facilitates filtration of blood in the kidneys. So while the glomerulus is a structure that we need to mention, we also need to go over this blood supply that can be found in the kidneys as well. So at this microscopic level, we'll get started with the afferent arteriole. Let's remember what the term afferent means. The A in afferent stands for arrive. So therefore, an afferent structure brings substances to another structure. This afferent arteriole will direct blood into this tiny capillary bed, which is known as the glomerulus. And then the efferent arteriole, E for exit, this is going to take substances away from the glomerulus and into these capillaries that can be found over here. And then the efferent arteriole is going to take these substances over to the second capillary bed that's going to course around the nephron. Now before I jump into what this capillary bed is doing over here, I first must go back to the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole and discuss a major difference between the two. The diameter of the afferent arteriole is larger than that of the diameter of the efferent arteriole. We saw a similar concept in the lymphatic system where there were more afferent vessels than there were efferent vessels. And the purpose of this in the lymphatic system was to slow lymph flow through the lymph nodes. The same idea is applied here. The afferent arteriole is larger, therefore it brings more blood into the glomerulus, and since the efferent arteriole is more narrow, it's unable to allow for substances to leave the glomerulus as quickly. So this arrangement will slow blood flow through the glomerulus, ensuring that filtration will take place in this capillary bed. Now this efferent arteriole is going to come back out here and enter into what are known as the peritubular capillaries. We call them the peritubular capillaries because these capillaries in particular will wrap around the functional tube of the kidneys. Peri means around. These are the capillaries that are around the nephron. 
Now the peritubular capillaries are eventually going to leave and form bigger and bigger vessels until they get back to the renal vein. But as blood from the peritubular capillaries leaves this area, the filtrate inside of the nephron is going to go somewhere else. As we discussed, it goes into the collecting duct, which will eventually lead to the minor and major calyces that dump into the renal pelvis. So what we can see with the blood supply of the kidneys, as well as the nephron of the kidneys as well, is that the substance that is entering this unit is going to get filtered and all of the bad products and nitrogenous wastes are going to leave the body through the collecting duct and all of the good components of blood are going to make their way back to the heart. Here is just another depiction of the structures in the nephron. You can see that we'll have the afferent arterial that can be found right here that's feeding the glomerulus. You can see that the glomerulus is this capillary bed that is covered up by the Bowman's capsule. That's going to be this structure that's on the outside of the glomerulus. In the glomerulus, filtration is going to take place and the Bowman's capsule will collect all of the filtrate that's coming out of the blood. And then the efferent arterial, which is more narrow than the afferent arterial, is going to eventually feed what's known as the peritubular capillaries. And we'll see those again labeled very shortly. The nephron in particular is going to go from the Bowman's capsule and dump into the proximal convoluted tubule and eventually dump into the loop of Henle. This is our thin descending portion of the loop of Henle. And then we have the thick ascending portion of the loop of Henle, which will eventually flow back into the distal convoluted tubule that can be found at the terminal end of the nephron. This end will eventually dump into the collecting duct where many other nephrons will release their filtrate into as well. And then the collecting ducts get larger and larger and larger as more nephrons are dumping into them and they will eventually go and dump that filtrate through the renal papillae into the minor calyx. So now that we have a fairly strong understanding of the components in different parts of the nephron, we're now going to shift our focus to the blood supply that can be found through the kidneys. So we know that blood goes to the kidneys through the renal artery and eventually comes from the kidneys through the renal vein. That oxygenated blood enters the kidneys through this renal artery, and that deoxygenated blood is going to leave through the renal vein. But what we've seen about the kidneys thus far is that once the renal artery enters into the kidneys, it's going to form many different branches that will course throughout the structures on the inside of the kidneys. One of the major branches that we need to understand coming from the renal artery is known as the arcuate artery. The arcuate artery is going to wrap around the renal pyramids. And then from the arcuate artery, we're going to branch out what's known as the cortical radiate artery, which will give rise to our afferent arterioles. Our efferent arterioles are going to enter those peritubular capillaries, and then the peritubular capillaries are eventually going to dump back into a structure known as the cortical radiate vein. And then the cortical radiate vein is then going to dump back into the arcuate vein, and then the arcuate veins are going to make their way back to the renal vein. One other fact that we need to understand about the blood flow through the kidneys is that 25% of all of our body's cardiac output will go to the kidneys to be processed at any given time. If we can remember that from AMP1, 20% of our blood goes up to the brain, that's almost half of all of the cardiac output that's going through the kidneys and the brain at any given time. Since the kidneys are the blood's filter, we need to pass a good amount of blood through there to make sure that no nitrogenous wastes are building up in our bloodstream. So with this knowledge, let's go ahead and look at the blood supply of the kidneys. So from the renal artery, you can see that there are many branches as this vessel enters into the kidneys. The first branch that we're going to see is known as the interlobar arteries. These interlobar arteries are eventually going to give rise to the arcuate arteries and veins that are coursing around the renal pyramids. It is the arcuate artery that's going to give rise to our cortical radiate artery, and the cortical radiate artery is the vessel that will supply the afferent arterial. We're going to zoom into the renal cortex to see how the cortical radiate artery gives rise to the afferent arterial very shortly. But before we start to zoom in on this, we're going to see how the renal arteries will give rise to the interlobar arteries that will give rise to the arcuate arteries. And you can see the arcuate arteries are going to be coursing around each of the renal pyramids. You'll also see the arcuate veins that will eventually take deoxygenated blood back from the renal pyramids and eventually allow those to flow through the interlobar veins and into the renal veins. So truly from this view, the renal blood supply looks rather symmetrical on either side. We have a renal artery and a renal vein. We have interlobar arteries and interlobar veins. 
and then we'll have arcuate arteries and arcuate veins, and we'll even have cortical radiate arteries and cortical radiate veins. But it is when we get to this microscopic level that there will be slight differences and not everything is going to seem exactly symmetrical. So we want to make sure that we understand these little discrepancies, but the majority of the kidney's blood flow is in fact symmetrical. We will go ahead and walk ourselves through this blood supply starting with the arcuate artery. So you can see the arcuate artery coursing here. This is going to indicate that the renal pyramid is going to be found in this region, which is also telling us that the medulla is found here. Anything above or superficial to the arcuate artery is going to be a part of the cortex. And we can come back to this slide to just show you how that looks. Our arcuate artery is shown here, and anything below it is going to be one of our renal pyramids, and anything above it is going to be a part of the renal cortex. So now that we have that distinction down, we can follow the arrows from the arcuate artery into the cortical radiate artery. And that's going to be this structure that can be found here. You can see from each cortical radiate artery, we'll have several branches of afferent arterioles that are coming off of this vessel. The cortical radiate arteries are going to give rise to many different afferent arterioles that will in turn feed many different glomeruli. So the afferent arteriole, which you can see is a little bit wider here, is eventually going to feed the glomerulus, which is wrapped up in the Bowman's capsule. Blood that has entered into the glomerulus is going to leave through the narrow efferent arteriole. And once again, you can see the difference in the size of the afferent arteriole from the efferent arteriole. The afferent arteriole is going to have a wider diameter to slow blood flow through the glomerulus in particular. The efferent arteriole will then continue on into what are known as the peritubular capillaries. And the peritubular capillaries are indicated by these purple vessels that are coursing just to the sides of the nephron. They're intricately weaving around the nephron, and their purplish color is indicating that oxygen diffusion is taking place in these vessels. In fact, the efferent arteriole is also taking out oxygenated blood. This tells us that the glomerulus does not facilitate oxygen transport. It's only going to facilitate filtration of the waste and water products of the blood. All of that oxygen is going to stay in this blood until it makes its way to the peritubular capillaries, which will eventually dump into the cortical radiate vein and you can see that many different peritubular capillary beds will all feed into the cortical radiate veins. The cortical radiate veins will eventually flow into the arcuate veins, which will feed the interlobar veins and eventually dump back into the renal vein. From here, blood enters back into the inferior vena cava and goes back to the heart to be reoxygenated through the pulmonary circulation. You can see that in particular with this nephron, we have our Bowman's capsule around the glomerulus, our proximal convoluted tubule that is one of the first parts of the nephron, but is also convoluted in its shape, hence where it gets its name. Eventually, the nephron will make its way down to the thin descending loop of Henle and then back to the thick ascending loop of Henle, and then up into our distal convoluted tubule, which will eventually make its way out and dump into the collecting duct. And you can see that both of these nephrons will both dump into the collecting duct, which can be found right here. In fact, many different nephrons will dump into the same collecting duct that will take substances out to the renal papillae. So now that we've discussed the blood supply of the kidneys, we're going to real quickly touch upon some of the other components that can be found in the urinary system. The ureter, we know, connects the renal pelvis down to the urinary bladder and that's going to facilitate urine transport down into the urinary bladder. As we have two kidneys, we must have two ureters, but those are going to dump into the same urinary bladder. The most important thing that I want you to understand about the urinary bladder is that this organ is distensible, which means that the urinary bladder can expand or shrink based on the contents that can be found within it. When there's lots of urine being stored in the urinary bladder, it will eventually open up and be more distended. But as the urinary bladder is emptied, the bladder will decrease in its size. And based on the amount of contents that can be found in the urinary bladder at the time of death, this will cause the urinary bladder to vary in size based on how full it was at the time of death. You can see that when this cat met its demise, it likely really had to go. The last component to discuss regarding the urinary system is the urethra. As I mentioned before, the length of the urethra differs from males to females. Males have a much longer urethra, and females have a much shorter urethra. The urethra is the primary component that's going to regulate the release of substances from the urinary bladder. This is actually a wonderful setup that the human body has. Thanks to the urinary bladder, we can store urine instead of releasing it whenever it's filtered. 
and thanks to the urethra, we can control when that release time is. Most of the urinary system serves transport functions to get urine from the kidneys out of the body. It is for this reason that the kidneys are dubbed the primary component of the urinary system. The second portion of this lab presentation will be discussing the concepts behind urinalysis. We can tell a lot about a person based on the contents of their urine. Differing concentrations of solutes in the urine can be indicators of different conditions. We will first discuss the parameters of normal urine and then we're going to make our way into the abnormalities. So normal urine has a pH range for which its parameters typically exist within. Anywhere between 4.5 and 8.0 are considered normal pHs for urine, but on average urine will be slightly acidic, ranging here around 6. Certain solutes will normally be found in the urine and other solutes will not. Based upon the presence or absence of these solutes, or perhaps the presence or solutes of abnormal solutes, we can make some inferences about the general health of the body. Urea is one of the most common solutes that we find in the urine, as well as sodium, potassium, phosphate, sulfate, creatinine, and uric acid. As I'm sure that you are already very much aware, the color of urine will vary based on how concentrated the urine is. To assess urine concentration, we use a factor known as specific gravity. For those of you that have not heard about specific gravity, specific gravity is the density of the urine divided by the density of water. Water has a density of one gram per centimeter cubed, or one gram per milliliter. Urine will always be a little bit more concentrated than water, so if we take a number that's slightly larger than that of one and divide it by one, we're going to get a number that's slightly greater than one. Once again, the specific gravity is a measure of how concentrated the urine is, and the normal parameters for specific gravity are between 1.001 and 1.030. We will use a special device to check specific gravity known as a refractometer. A refractometer's function is to measure the solute concentrations that can be found in any urine sample. This is the tool that can check specific gravity. Using a refractometer is quite simple. You can see that there's this little flap here, and on the other end there's this rotatable end piece. In order to check a substance's specific gravity, you'll lift this flap up and put a drop of the substance that you're interested in on this little window. Once you've done this, you'll put the flap back down, and on the other side of this rotatable end, you'll see that there's a little eyepiece that you can look through. From here, you'll see a view that looks something like this. It can be a little difficult to get the hang of the refractometer at first, but once you position this to the right type of lighting, you should get a very clear picture. There's a lot that we can determine from the refractometer, but specific gravity is our factor of interest. This reading, labeled UG, is the scale for specific gravity. What we're looking at in particular on this slide is the specific gravity of water. The reason that we can see that is because this blue line will be shown at the level of the specific gravity. In particular, this blue line is shown at the reading that is labeled 1. And when we take the density of water and divide it by itself, that gives us a reading of 1. As I change slides here, I want you to focus on the movement of the blue line. On this next slide, we're going to see a sample of something that is no longer water. You can see that right here is where 1 is at, which is where our blue line was at when we were looking at water. But here, with the dilute urine sample, you can see that the refractometer's blue line goes up a little bit. We can see that this reading is consistent with 1.008, which is going to be a hydrated sample of urine. Based upon increasing amounts of solutes in the urine, your specific gravity will go up. And again, typically the parameter on the high end of the specific gravity for urine is 1.030. So I'd like you to be able to identify the refractometer, and I'd also like you to understand the formula for specific gravity. You take the density of the substance and divide it by the density of water, which is 1. So the last concept that we need to discuss with this lab presentation is understanding the abnormal constituents of urine. Many of you have likely used pH paper before, but these strips in particular are very specialized for giving us a slew of information about the contents of urine. You can see that this dipstick will have many different squares that are next to each other, and each square checks for a different solute. When you have a sample of urine, you can take this dipstick and submerge it in the fluid. 
If there is an excess of any of the components that can be found in the urine, that will show in the color of these squares after the dipstick is removed from the solution. You'll be able to line up the dipstick with each of these squares and rotate the container to see what the concentrations of different solutes are. These abnormal constituents of urine can be found described on page 1023 of your textbook. In the event that any of these substances can be found in the urine, these can indicate different conditions. In the event that something can be found in the urine, we typically use the suffix urea to describe that. So if there's glucose that can be found in the urine, we call that condition glucosuria. Most often, glucosuria indicates diabetes mellitus. As we're unable to take up glucose from the bloodstream, the glucose tends to leak into the urine. Albumin is one of our larger plasma proteins, and it's generally so big that it's unable to leak through the glomerulus. So if we do end up with albuminuria, that typically is going to indicate that we have some type of glomerular damage, as the junctions of the glomerular cells is likely going to be loosened. This is one of the major conditions that albuminuria will indicate. Other plasma proteins can also be found in the blood, and we would simply call this proteinuria. This will also indicate that we have some type of glomerular damage, and the filter of our kidney is not functioning properly. Ketone bodies are a byproduct of metabolism that show up when our body is undergoing starvation. In the event that we are starving, we'll often find ketone bodies in the urine. We call this ketonuria. Red blood cells are also not supposed to be found in the urine. If we do find them in the urine, we call this hematuria. Red blood cells are large enough that under normal conditions, they're not supposed to leak through the glomerulus into the nephron. So if we do find erythrocytes in the urine, this can indicate renal calculi, infections of any type, or perhaps some type of trauma to the body. You may not have heard of renal calculi before. These just indicate kidney stones. There is a difference between finding red blood cells in the urine and finding hemoglobin in the urine. If hemoglobin can be found in the urine, this means that we're having something affecting our red blood cells. Perhaps a transfusion reaction that's leading to cell lysis, or perhaps hemolytic anemia. While both are not good, hemoglobinuria is different from hematuria. Bile pigments in the urine indicates bilirubinuria. This refers to increased levels of bilirubin in the urine. Bilirubin is a yellowish pigment that comes from the liver. So if we do find bilirubin in the urine, we know we want to be looking at the liver as the cause of this condition. And lastly, if we find white blood cells in the urine, we call this pyuria. Increased numbers of white blood cells is known as leukocytosis, and typically leukocytosis takes place in cases of inflammation. So if we find lots of white blood cells in the urine, this is indicating that inflammation is likely taking place at some place in our body. This will conclude our presentation on the urinary system. If you have any questions at all about the material in this video, please reach out and send me a message. I will see you all for our next lab presentation when we will discuss the reproductive systems.